Good morning, Mission Gathering San Diego. We are grateful to have you with us. We are looking forward to a time of worship and fellowship. Say hello to somebody right there in the sidebar, whichever side that is, the comments. And let's pray as we move ahead. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the resources that we have to do this. We pray your blessing on the music and the word and especially our connection to you and to each other. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's move into musical worship. The key of the mind be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, woe is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, woe is my song. You are good, you good. Oh 
a lot of stuff going on here at Mission Gathering San Diego, even though we are meeting virtually. If you go to our website, missiongatheringsd.org, click on our small groups tab. You can find a few different groups that are in process right now. We've got a couple more that are starting up, including our outside of San Diego group, just getting ready to, I think that's gonna be starting again the end of February. And this is a terrific, terrific group. Some of the most amazing people I've met have connected with us from other countries while we are meeting virtually. And if you have questions or needs, please be sure to get in touch with myself or Pastor Rich. We want to connect with you. We want to answer your questions. And we're here for pastoral care as well, as is our, our pastoral care team. And this happens. We're able to do all of this because we give. We give financially. We give of our resources. We give of our time and talents. So we would ask, I would ask, that you be in prayer about how God wants you connected to the ministry that's happening here at Mission Gathering. Whether that's um, finding out what kind of outreach we're doing, getting involved in a small group, getting involved in service to others, and giving financially. So all the information to do this is on our website down at the bottom of our screen. We want you to not hesitate to reach out. Let's pray as we go into our offering. Lord, we are grateful for all of the things that you provide for us so we can be committed to you and serving in community. So Lord, we pray that everything that we are being motivated and led to share, that we would remember where that's coming from, that we would respond with stewardship and with contentment and from a space of faith and courage and an understanding that you you meet our needs you provide for our needs so take what we have to give multiply it bless it and use it for your good and your glory and the blessing of our community and our outreach to the world we pray that in jesus name amen good morning everyone and in this part of the gathering this is where we like to dive into the scriptures uh, unpack what we see that the scriptures, uh, as we study the scriptures and we journey through the calendar, church calendar known as the lectionary, what the scriptures may have for us. And I want to say a special hello to Mission Gathering Issaquah, who's joining us this morning. And of course, Mission Gathering Pasadena, a Mission Gathering San Diego. And if you do not know who I am, that's okay. Uh, my name is Rich McCullen, and I'm the founding pastor of uh, Mission Gathering San Diego and Mission Gathering Pasadena. And I help and uh, I help Devin, your pastor, in the leadership uh, and mentorship for the church there in Mission Gathering Issaquah. So before we dive into the scripture, which is Mark chapter 1, 29 through 39, let's pray. Uh, gracious, loving God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace for all of us. And I know, God, there's, there's those of us who are in a challenging time in our lives. Um, we are in the middle of this pandemic, but we believe, God, that there is hope. We see the light at the end of this tunnel. But Lord, as we are gathered here today virtually, and we are literally gathered in community electronically, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit is with us right now, and that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would open up our minds and our hearts to what you would have us learn from the gospel reading this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. So let's just jump right into the scripture here. Uh, Mark 1, 29 through 39. After leaving the synagogue, remember that's where Jesus started his public ministry. Uh, he just came from the desert. And uh, we're going to talk more about the desert experience of Jesus's desert experience as we head into Lent. But we know that Jesus was in the desert that was pushed out by the Holy Spirit. And now he came uh, back into uh, community. He was, with, he was battling evil. He was uh, growing in what God had planned for God's mission here on earth. 
And so now he's back in, he, he comes back and he goes right to the synagogue. And we talked about that last week. And I'll talk a little bit more about that this morning. But again, after leaving the synagogue, Jesus, James, and John went home with Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, sick with a fever. And they told Jesus about her at once. And he went to her and he took her by the hand and he raised her up. The fever left her and she served them. Again, I want to touch on that Jesus started his public ministry in the synagogue. Now, John the Baptist was outside of the temple and where he was preaching about the kingdom of God and how Jesus would baptize us all in the spirit and in salvation, we recognize we own the fact that we're in desperate need of God. And in salvation, we allow the Holy Spirit to take us. And we, we connect with the divine spark, I call the God spark, the image of God within us all. And we live into being a disciple of Christ. And that's what John meant, that I will baptize you in water, but Jesus will baptize you in the spirit. Jesus will bring complete uh, inward change that would impact all of who you are, impact your mind, your soul, your strength. That was the mission of God here on earth, to, to reconcile all of us to God. But here we know that Jesus starts his ministry in the institutional space of faith. Jesus doesn't abandon the institutional religion. He doesn't ban abandon organized religion, but Jesus desires to be a part of changing what was, what was known as a very controlling uh, force of religion. Jesus came in the place where religion and God was focused, but knew that the message of the kingdom would be a message of liberation. And so it started in the synagogue. Now, the thing about the synagogue is that it's mainly, the synagogue is mainly a place for men, right? Uh, we know there's spaces where women can be. Uh, after, you know, when you study the scriptures, you know this to be true, but that's not the case mainly. It's a place for men only. But the huge part of the new covenant of God, what Jesus' mission was um, and, and is today through the power of the Holy Spirit is to bring the kingdom of God in a very real, tangible, transformative way in our lives. And so Jesus not only taught in the synagogue uh, of the kingdom of God, but also knew that the, the spirit of God, the message of the kingdom of God, would, was to go outside of the temple walls, that the message of God, the message of Yahweh, the message, the stories, would not just be for the select few in the synagogue, but the message of God that desires a relationship with all of us was, was going outside of the temple, and that was the mission of Jesus also. And we see that Jesus goes into a house, right? This is the beginning in, in, in the Mark's gospel. This is the beginning of Jesus's public ministry, the synagogue where he teaches about the good news of the kingdom of God. A miracle even takes place. He's confronted by evil and he, and he, uh, he, uh, he completely uh, confronts that evil back and, and casts that that evil, that demon out of the person in the synagogue, which means, hey, uh, all people uh, who are good, bad, and full of our demons, which we all have our demons, metaphorically speaking, should be in a place of faith, should be in a place, should be welcomed in the institutional place of faith. That's not always, not, that's not always been the case, but since the beginning of Jesus's ministry, that was God's heart's desire. Okay, but we see here that Jesus goes into a house, an ordinary house, a private place, a place where who can be themselves, who can feel they don't have to be trapped by the religious trappings or the culture, cultural ex expectations. Who would that be? That would be women. So we know that women 
felt very comfortable in a space where they could just be themselves and not worry about the judgment of men, not to worry about the judgment of culture, and not worried about the pretense and the judgments of religion. And that's also a part, this space, an institutional faith space to a home space is where Jesus starts his ministry. And we know just reading the scripture, that the home belongs to Simon and Andrew, the two brothers who were first recruited as followers of Jesus, who experienced a transformation, are now giving their lives and following Jesus. And Jesus enters into the house where everyone can just, again, just be themselves. And we, we have two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And it's told in the scripture that, that Simon's mother-in-law is in bed. She's sick. She's very sick. And at that time, if you were sick and you were in bed and you weren't a part of what needed to happen in the everyday life of, of uh, running a home then, then you, 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 you know that she had to have been very, very sick. And then again, it says in verse 31, and he went to her and he took her by the hand. Jesus, a Jewish man, uh, even seen now as a rabbi, takes her by the hand and, 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 and raises her up. And the fever left her and she served them. There's a lot in that one sentence. Well, of course, I'm going to do my best to unpack that. To, uh, to help us allow the Spirit of God to um, see what's happening here. Now notice, it's a woman. There's no name. There's no name. There's no Mary. There's no, there's no names of this woman. And what that means is she was known to the authors of the gospel as an ordinary woman. Now, other women in the Bible are named, right? They're named. There's Martha. There's Mary. They're named they, because they weren't, as we would, uh, as the authors of the Gospels would put, they weren't ordinary. They were women that was a part of the plan, uh, women who were a part of advancing the kingdom of God, the message of grace, transformation. They were there. In fact, we know that women were there the entire time. We know that when the men ran from the cross, the women stayed at the cross. We know that through church history, women were pastors in the very beginning of the church. We know that women have carried this church, this body of Christ that we know today by women. It's been empowered by women. It's been worked through by women. And, um, and for us as a church throughout the world, and especially in America, to still be in a place where women cannot lead, where women cannot be pastors, yes, for a lot of you, I know this is a shock, that still exists in institutional religion. That still exists in many evangelical churches. But we can see in the Gospels that women were a vital part of what Jesus' plan, God's plan, was for redemption, the plan of setting us free to know God's love and God's grace, to experience that, to experience uh, renewal. But women were a huge, huge piece of this. And we talk a lot about the men in the Bible because there's a lot of men in the Bible, but there's some very, very important women in the Bible. But she you know, was an ordinary woman. I can relate to this. I'm ordinary. And so are you. We're ordinary people. I can relate to this woman, right? So again, we see that Jesus is beginning his ministry. And what stands out to me, there's two things that stands out to me just with this one sentence. One, that Jesus goes from the institutional faith space, right? And he goes into a home where the ordinary are. And he reaches his hand out to someone in need and heals her. That Jesus goes, literally, Jesus goes to the least of society to raise up the least, the last to become first. That Jesus's miracles, right? There was the, 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 
the confrontation of evil in the synagogue. If you remember last week, and if, if, you, if you don't, just, uh, it's just a few verses up. Just read that. But that was not necessarily a miracle, though it probably was for that individual to be set free from darkness. But here we see the first miracle in the book of Mark is a woman receiving healing. The least in cultural uh, um, ways of the biblical time, women were seen as second-class citizens. And Jesus' first miracle, healing, is a woman. That Jesus goes beyond the stereotypes of religion, breaks down the walls of religion, and allows what uh, James, in the book of James, Jesus' brother calls pure religion. The realness of God, the life-changing love of God, the total acceptance of God, that no matter what our gender, uh, race, or economical standard, we are all the same in the kingdom of God. We're all the same in the eyes of God. And so he heals and restores a woman who probably a lot of times feels less because of culture. And it, it, it's changed a lot, but it, there still is this struggle. And what I love about the ordinary person, like you and I, she was so ordinary that the authors, I mean, obviously they knew her name, did not put her name there. She's ordinary. I love, I just love it that Jesus takes the ordinary and makes uh, extraordinary, right? Not a play on words there too much, but it's true. Ordinary you and I, through the power of God's love and God's grace, and allowing ourselves to walk in knowing how loved we are by God. Stuff. All right, so verse 31. He went to her and took her by the hand and raised her up. And then it says this, the fever left her. Okay, that's a miracle. That's a healing. Wonderful. Great. She's feeling good. She's feeling restored. Now she just, she's going to hang out with the guys and she's going to, you know, be one of the guys and because there's all guys in there, right? Okay? And she, she's just going to be one of them and hang out. No, that's not what happens. And this part of the scripture, it throws a lot of us. It says that she served them. What? He, she serves them. Sick sick in bed, can't function in the house, can't be a part of what needs to happen to make life happen. She is so sick, she's in bed. Jesus raises her up. There's a healing. There's a physical transformation. And what does she do? She starts to serve them. Do you need some, you need some really good wine? I'm sure uh, Simon's giving you the cheap wine, but I've got the good stuff. Uh, I just baked some bread. This afternoon, what's your name, right? Jesus? Okay, cool. I've heard a little bit about you, and now I love you. This is awesome. Let me get this for you. And I got some perfect food. I'll warm it up for you. I'll get this ready for you. All of a sudden, it's like all, you know, he goes to the ordinary. He goes to the woman, empowers her to be restored in community, and she begins to serve them. It, it kind of like hits you, like, okay, what's going on here? Well, one, it's culture right? It's, it's their culture. And it, and it doesn't mean um, it was, it was, uh, she was less of a person. It was their culture. But what's interesting about this, and Simon Peter, Peter's mother-in-law served immediately being raised. The word in the Greek that describes served, the Greek word served, is the same verb that Jesus himself uses to describe the essence of his own ministry. In Mark 10, 45, it is to serve, not to be served. You see what's happening here? That characterizes the heart of Jesus. The word that is used here is that she doesn't get up and serve them like a, like a you know, a, a a restaurant server? No. She serves them, and the word from the Greek is the same word that Jesus used to describe his ministry of serving humanity, that it's not about, it's not about how great I look, it's not about how, um, 
how much status I can get. It's about me serving you so you can experience the love of Jesus. It's me washing your feet to the people who would betray him. It's me, Jesus, breaking bread to those who are hungry, serving the people, loving the people. And that's exactly what she does. Not only is she just ordinary and she's a woman, she's one of the first disciples that lives to serve people to the love of God. A woman. One of the first person, I guess, to make it more um, um, understandable or, or where we are today, culturally understandable, she's empowered to lead because she is serving. She's serving in a discipleship way, not in a restaurant server way, which is great. I love going to restaurants. I miss going to restaurants and being served. I love that. That's not what's happening here. She is serving as a disciple. She is serving as a person who is sacrificing and living in to what God would have all of us do. And that is serve one another, help one another, uplift each other, that we might be more, that we might be more uh, what we are called to be as followers of Jesus. So let's go down to verse 32. The, that evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. And the whole town gathered near the door. And he healed many, the Bible says, who were sick with all kinds of diseases. And he threw out many demons. But he didn't let the demons speak. Because, why? Because they recognized him. They knew Jesus was the Messiah. But he did not let them speak. So what we get first of all is that people brought, they worked at the end of the day. Right? It was a Sabbath, because remember it started in the, it started in the synagogue. So it was a Sabbath. And, and by tradition of faith, they weren't to work. As sunset happens in Jewish culture, the end of Sabbath, it's a new day. So they wait until evening comes at sunset, dusk, and then they begin to work toward experiencing and knowing God's healing power. They respected the Sabbath sacredness. Christians, so many Christians out there that are deconstructing. That's why you watch this every week. You are deconstructing your faith. My challenge to us is this. In the search of this new Christianity, which is not new at all. It's been here 2,000 years. But just rediscovering, living into this gospel Christianity. Let's not leave behind the sacredness of our faith. Let's not leave it behind. And again, he did not allow the demons to speak. Why is that? Because he did not want uh, power. He did not want power of the demons' voices to have power over him. Yeah, use your words, Rich. He did not want them to speak because he didn't want their voices to have any power of what his mission was. In my journey and in your journey, we are so, so um, consumed with the voices of the past, the voices that I call our demons, right? Metaphorically speaking, our demons, the things that we've done in the past that hold us back from truly being the best um, spouse or the best partner that we can be, the voices that make us feel less because they're the voices of uh, of, of denigration, voices of hurt and pain from other people in our lives. And we let them play over and over in our head. And they seem to take control of our everyday actions, our everyday wants for ourselves. And we allow those voices to hold us back. The 
what Jesus is saying to us through this story and this morning, if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak this to your, to your heart, is this. Jesus is all about setting us free from those voices. Those voices of darkness, those voices of doubt, those voices of, of despair. Jesus is about voices of hope and grace and restoration. That's the voice of God. Not what you are told, the voice of God is damnation. The voice of God is anger. That's not God. That's not the gospels of Jesus. That's not what true, real, pure religion, Christianity is. And also because he did not want a more practical way of looking at this also, is that he did not want an early recognition of his messiahship. He did not want people to know yet that he was claiming that he is God in the flesh, the Messiah, because that would compromise his ministry. And also he he avoided the the entrapment of popularity. They have been looking for their Messiah for 200 years, more than that, hundreds of years. They all grew up studying the Torah. They all grew up knowing the prophecies. They've been, they're looking for the Messiah to overthrow their, uh, their, uh, um, the Roman Empire. People who, the Roman Empire who was occupying them. They were looking, but they, Jesus knew if that got out too soon, which darkness would love that to get out too soon, that it would compromise what Jesus was trying to do And he didn't want people to get tripped up on that. He wanted people just to see that the Spirit of God lives and walks with the ordinary. So verse 35, in closing, I say that about three times, in closing. Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. We could be alone in prayer. And it's interesting because uh, it goes on to say, Simon and those with him tracked him down. (laughs) It's early in the morning. They're like, they got up and like, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And according to the the Greek, it's an intent, it's an intent, oh goodness, I, I I gotta use the right word. It's an intense, thank you. Someone said it out loud and I heard you. It's an intense search. They're like really freaking out. Where did Jesus go? And when Simon, verse 36, when Simon and those with him tracked him down and they found him, they told him, hey, Jesus, everyone's looking for you, dude. Like, what are you doing right now? Like this, we've got a show here. We've got to keep it going. And Jesus said, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, 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 a show here. I am God in the flesh and I'm on mission. And so even Jesus, God, needed to uh, separate and focus in on things that are not of this world, needed to meditate, needed to focus in on the love of God, the love and the grace of Yahweh, right? And so do you and I. So do you and I. And as we go into communion, uh, I want to challenge us. Um, in verse 30, he says, and, he's, and he, he replied, after, you know, they're very intense. They're running around. They're looking for him. And they go, we, you know, everyone's looking for you. And he replied, okay, cool. Thank you. Good morning. He replied, uh, let's head in the other direction. Wait a minute, we got a really good thing here. You see, Jesus always combated popularity um, over, and he just, he could have stayed in that part of town and become a local uh, celebrity. But Jesus knew he had things to do. Jesus is like, mm, mm, that's cool. But we got, we got to go on. Let's head, the, let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so I can preach there too. Preach, right? You, preach is, you know, take away the P, you have reach, and then take away the PR, you have each. That's good, isn't it? That's good. 
that, that will preach. But anyway, preach there too. That's why I've come. When Jesus says, I, I'm, I'm going to preach, reach each, I've come for that. Because what? What is the gospel? Come on, say it out loud. You can say it, the good news. You can type it in there, the good news. The good news of God. Not bad news, the good news. And he traveled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues. There we are again. And then outside the synagogues, in and out, living into the kingdom of God. And, and I, love how it, I love how the common English version puts it. And throwing out demons. Throwing out our darkness. Throwing out the voices that hold us back. There's a lot of things that are holding you back from experiencing this love that I've talked about all morning. There's a lot holding you back from just being uh, a completely accepted by God and a faith community. Beyond the pandemic, I'm talking about the voices. I'm talking about the voices of the past. I'm talking about allowing your demons to have too much control or any control in your life. It's not God's heart. It's not God's desire. And so as we head into communion this morning, I ask that you please take that serious and you, you, uh, you have the, uh, some type of elements with you, uh, some bread, uh, wine, or grape juice. And with me that we intentionally seek God this morning. So as we prepare our hearts and open our minds to the message of communion, we're reminded that Jesus said, as you do this, do this in remembrance of the mission of God, the hope and the love of God. That this bread represents Jesus' body. And Jesus lifted up the bread and he said, this is my body, broken. God's body, broken for the brokenness of man and women and culture and society. The brokenness of religion, the brokenness of culture, of, of politics. God's body was broken that we may all experience wholeness in the love and the grace of God. And then he took the wine and he poured it into the chalice and he said, this is the love of God that is poured out. Look at that. God's love is not even contained by a glass, right? <laughs> the love of God poured out for all of us that we may partake and know and be reminded that God never gave up on us and God still is not given up on us. God is with us right now, even in this pandemic. So as you take that bread and you dip it in the wine, I ask that you open your heart to allow yourself to go in a new direction this morning. You allow yourself to be open to the Spirit of God to taking you into a space of complete acceptance of God. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, bring us to a space of your love and your grace. Help us to allow the Holy Spirit, your voice, to speak louder than the voices of the demons, our past, our struggles, our secrets. As we partake of this, these elements of grace, we ask God that we're, we begin to forgive ourselves and we begin the process of forgiving others. We love you, Lord. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You know what? Let's just close it out. Thank you for being here this Sunday. Um, and if you have any questions about what I preached about this morning, my direct email is rich at missiongathering.com but god bless you we will continue with this journey uh, into the uh, and the book of mark and the lectionary and especially as we head into lent yes easter is on its way spring new life is on its way until next week god bless you remember always okay you <laughs> maybe you forget everything i say here today which i hope you don't remember this you are loved god loves you just the way you are I'll see you next week.